Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're here, that we can study some of the truth as it comes to us from your word and that we can have confidence in who Jesus really is. And we thank you for that. And Lord, we seek your presence, of course. Be amongst our number as we consider your word. We thank you for those that are here, those who are not, whatever the cause, whatever the reason. Bless them, be with them, and draw them near to you too. And so, Lord, open our minds and our hearts, we pray, that we may see clearly the truth as you have entrusted it to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that you're having a lot of information, but it's really worth it. What we're really, again, still looking at is that prophetic evidence and the historical evidence that really do make up the objective evidence, and then there will be a little bit on the subject, subjective evidence as well. Um, this is the last in the series. It's not that there's not enough uh, more material for more, but we condense it to just a few presentations. You recall that the angel Gabriel, two and a half thousand years ago plus, visited a prophet by the name of Daniel there in Babylon. And he gave a number of predictions in the year 539 BC. We can date it because that's the first year of Darius, the son of our Sphere's the Mede. Uh, he was the father-in-law of Cyrus who conquered that particular uh, property, that particular capital of Babylon, Babylon itself. And so he made a lot of predictions, and he, he really predicted the year of the baptism of Jesus, which really is the beginning of the ministry, or the public ministry of Jesus. And it is absolutely pivotal that we are correct on the dates and the details, because what we are also going to talk about, of course, is the crucifixion of Jesus. We can also date the crucifixion of Jesus, and in fact... This very angel gave the prediction to Daniel what emperor would be presiding when Jesus would be crucified. And I'm going to present you that uh, today. I think it's a remarkable prophecy that you'll find in the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel. So we're going to come back to that. What fascinates me is this that he gave the prediction of the year of the close of probation for the Jews. That is not to say that Jews after that date couldn't be saved anymore. They can be saved like anybody else. But as a chosen people, and please, this is important, as a chosen people, as the instrument of God's choosing to evangelize the world by drawing the other nations to them, because an obedient life and the blessings that would flow forth from it, of course, that came to an end because they did not, they did not fulfill their role. And so it is important that we recognize that. And so, 70 weeks determined on his people, your people, the holy city, of course, his people were the Jews, and the holy city, of course, is Jerusalem. Now, you and I understand that the 70 weeks... Uh, are not to be expressed in days. Uh, they really, they really seventy sets or of sevens, and really they are years. And I defended that principle last week and made it perfectly plain why this is so. You remember I've shown you this. We filled in all the gaps. The Bible gives you so much information that you can fill in all the gaps. And I know you must have felt that you were bombarded with dates and, 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 and details of events. But let's face it. Let's face it. If you believe in Jesus and you believe that he was whom he said he was, he can only be to you today what he should be to you today. And it is important that you are of an understanding. You may not have the capacity of reproduction, I accept that. But it is important that you hear the historical facts as they were made by the prophecies and were recorded 
in known history. That is vitally important. Jesus was an historical person, and not only that, he was absolutely whom he said he was, and I'll give you more evidence to that effect as well. More forthcoming. The fascinating part of that 70 weeks is actually the last week, from 27 AD to 34 AD, because the text I showed you last week said that he would actually, in the middle of the week, he would be cut off, quite violently. The verb karat means violently he would come to his end. And that is what happened in the middle of that week, and we know when Jesus was crucified, and we have extra biblical evidence galore for that, we know, we know for a fact it was at the Passover, and of course it had to be the Passover. He was the anti-typical Passover lamb. You understand that? Yeah? By the way, if it gets a little bit warm in here, the air conditioning was broken. I've made a number of phone calls. They still haven't fixed it yet. Unfortunately, it gets a little bit warm, but I'm probably warmer than you, so sympathize with me and not yourself. Stay awake. All right. So if we consider all the dates that we looked at and all the details, and we come to 31 AD because that happened in the autumn of 27 AD. You add three and a half years, you come to the spring northern hemisphere AD, which is the time of the Passover. Add another three and a half years, you come to 34 AD, and we have always as a denomination defended that the close of probation for the Jewish people came to that culmination with the stoning of Stephen. Now, people have said, you people, I always like it when they say that. When I have discussions with other denominations, they say, you people just picked that date. No, no, hang on a minute, we don't. I'll give you the historical evidence of that date as well. That found place in 34 AD, the stoning of Stephen. No question about it. Now, now, when you look at this whole time frame, the 70 years, it is actually part of a longer prophecy, namely a prophecy of 2,300 years. And you've got to understand, if this prophecy is wrong, either by starting date or duration, then clearly the 2,300 years is another question which we're not dealing with today. If it's in the Bible, if God in his goodness has given us the details, I believe we ought to own it in a sense that we should understand it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. And I want a response here. By, by, just raise your hands. How many of you have a driver's license? Now, you didn't get it with a packet of margarine, did you? You had to go study the booklet. Then you go, you have your instructor telling you what you're doing wrong. Then you take a, a test, correct? You got to make an effort. Most people will make an effort for a driver's license, but not to get this inside their head. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And I, I truly am convicted that this is no harder, it's no more difficult than getting your driver's license. If you can make a cake, ladies, you can learn that. Well, some cakes are better than others. A good cake, you understand? Okay. So, let's look at this. These dates are absolutely pivotal. Jesus was crucified, spring northern hemisphere, during the Passover, 31 AD. That is set in concrete. And I'll give you some further details here. The angel predicts the year of Jesus' public ministry, which commenced with his baptism as he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove. When did that find place? 
Have you ever heard of antedating or inclusive reckoning? How many of you have heard of that? Ah, there's a couple of you here. Now let me explain something to you. The Bible is written by Jews. Yeah, by and large. There's a couple of, Luke, you could argue, he was Greek. Uh, might have had some Jewish, what shall I say, past or connection. But he was a Greek, we're not sure what he was. He was obviously a proselyte into, one would expect, Judaism. He became a Christian and he wrote the book of the Gospel of Luke. But all the information that he relied on, all the other writers, it was all Jewish. This system of antedating or inclusive reckoning is right throughout the Bible, and I could give you many examples of this, but I won't. I deal with this one. So it is an inclusive reckoning, and when I get the further details, I'll explain to you exactly what that term really, really means. But it's very important. In the Gospel of Luke, you have this statement, that in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, John, had his, John the Baptist had his ministry. He had a powerful but very short ministry. And, and in a very short time that he began his ministry, Jesus was baptized by him. We all know that, and that's what the Gospels teach us. Now, when he puts it in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, you can go to any number of websites, and you will find that most denominations will put this on event as having occurred on 29 AD, and I'll tell you why. Tiberius Caesar, we'll talk about him. I have a fascinating account here for you. Tiberius Caesar succeeded Augustus Caesar. You've heard of Augustus Caesar? Right. Augustus Caesar died in 14 AD. And people say, well, if we have the 15th year, you add 15 to 14, because Tiberius Caesar succeeded him straight away. And 14 plus 15 is 29. You've got it wrong. And if that were to be true, then the probation of the Jews also need to be extended. And you might have to have another look at the other connecting longer prophecies as well. Let's have a look at it. The date of the death of Caesar Augustus, we know, was the 19th of August, 14 AD. He died peaceably, and I'll come back to that. Now, as I said, this is a Hebrew document. You may never hear this again in any church for an awful long time, because this may even well be the first time you hear this. This portion of time is important. It brings us to a month called Tisre. What is important about that is this. You know, we go from the 1st of January to the 31st of December, correct? Well, the Jewish reckoning wasn't like that. They went from autumn to autumn, northern hemisphere. And October, mid-October, thereabouts, is autumn. So if I take this little spot down here in the Jewish reckoning, that little portion, which is, as you may see, barely a month, is counted, is inclusive, it is counted as one year. Did you get that? Everybody? It's not that warm here yet. Hey? You're all awake? This is counted as one year. So the time after that, so that's the first year of Tiberius. As I said, that might have been only a month. Now the time after that, when Tishrei, the month finishes, you go to the second year of Tiberius. Now, so we move the whole thing by some 13 years. Adds 13 years. Let's have a look. Let's pick the same time of the year again. This portion, this portion here, brings you really to 27 AD. To the Jewish reckoning, this is the end 
of 27 AD. Now, of course, this all becomes, this all becomes uh, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Jesus must have been baptized somewhere in that area here because that becomes the 15th year. Are you with me? And as far as we are concerned, the end of 27 AD is right there. We have the autumn in the nor northern hemisphere. The baptism of Jesus would have been very shortly after the end of Tishra, which would be end October or beginning of November. Does anybody get that? If you don't fully understand it, I'll, I'll, I'll sympathize with you, but I'm telling you that this is how you look at it. Which means one thing. That when the gospel writer, Luke, when he wrote down that Jesus was baptized in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, he is absolutely correct because that is what happened. Right in that little time frame of a few weeks, maybe a month, Jesus was baptized. You can work this one out. You'll never work out his date of birth. And most certainly, it was not the 25th of December. There's a number of good reasons why that couldn't have been true. Now, having made a fuss of this, he predicts, predicts the year of Jesus' crucifixion and under which emperor. Now, this has always fascinated me. It is not a, a well-known prophecy, but it's in the book of Daniel, and I can date this particular prophecy to 536 B.C., Give or take a year if you have to. 536 is the year that this prediction was made by the angel Gabriel. And Daniel recorded it. He recorded it for the purpose that you could sit here today, that you could work out from known history, secular history if you like, that you can find out that that prophecy was 100% right. And if everything is right, prophetically speaking, uh, if everything is right about the person of Jesus, you'd have to take notice of his teachings and what he said. Now, so he gets the, the visitant who gives him the detail. This is what he's saying. And it's all to do with the... Um, Allegory of the king of the north. I don't know if you ever heard that term from the Bible, the king of the north. Have you? Great. The king of the north is a designation that has varied to various entities, but in this particular setting, in this particular chronology, historical events, it really designates Rome. Now, I wish I would have the time to take you through the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel and show you clearly that it is, but you can read this for yourself and I'll be very happy to study with you if you're still not convinced. The king of the north versus the king of the south. You have Israel here. Above them, basically, we had the invading forces of the Romans. To the south, they had Egypt. Those were the two main forces. So the king of the north is the invading forces of the Romans and the king of the south is Egypt. And you find that in a number of places in the Bible. So we go to the book of Daniel and we particularly study the 11th chapter or at least a portion thereof. I like some of those pictures from Hollywood. They look real, don't they? Uh, the text is there, Daniel 11, 16 to 22. To the left, of course, we have Egypt. Yeah, is that clear? And Egypt was what? The king of the south. But he who comes <clears throat> against him, the king of the south, and I know you should look at it in the context, he who comes against him shall do according to his will. There was a... There was a power struggle with Rome, which Rome did win. And we know for a fact they did. No one shall stand against him. Well, that's the one that came against that one. 
Are you still following me so far? It's not hard, it's not hard, it's all there. Now, he, <clears throat> the Roman power, shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. In 63 BC, Pompey invaded, the Roman general invaded Jerusalem. They finally breached the wall. They finally, they finally got through. Then the Jews had withdrawn into the temple grounds. They were going to defend themselves, but they were overcome by the Romans. And, 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 and then they all were lying in front of the holy place. They wanted to stop him from going into the holy place. But Pompey took no notice. He just stepped over them and on them and he walked and barged into the holy place straight for the most holy place. And when he just threw that curtain aside, what did he see? Nothing. Nothing. And he turned around to his officers, what kind of a God are these people worshipping? There's nothing. And he marched out again. Because the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, was never, never present in the second temple. Never. It's interesting, but that's how it was. He shall give him, that is the king of the south, the daughter of women to destroy it. Ptolemy the Eleventh was involved in that. He had a sister by the name of Cleopatra. Ever heard of her? Oh, there's a movie on that. Richard Burton with uh, Taylor, the Taylor girl. Yeah, that's right, that's right. He shall give him, Julius Caesar, the daughter of women to destroy. It should read him. That would be a better translation. And that is uh, supposed to be a likeness of Cleopatra. Not too flattering, I'm sure, but there it is. But she shall not stand with him or before him. It's very interesting. Ptolemy XI gave her more or less into the care of Julius Caesar as a protectorate. Because Egypt had weakened. Within three years she became the mistress of Julius Caesar. And so... You say, that's nice, but the woman had self-interest. She was very ambitious for Egypt. She wanted, she wanted the prominence of Egypt that was most on her mind. Even after, when Caesar was assassinated, she tried it on with Mark Antony. I think Richard Burton played that role, didn't he? Mark Antony. I don't know how long that movie goes back. Some of you are looking at me like you don't, you weren't even born yet. <laughs> oh. and, so, and so that all failed and she ultimately committed suicide. She tried, to, she tried it on with Octavius who became Caesar Augustus. Uh, he wouldn't have her. <laughs> and so she committed suicide. Now it's interesting, um, there was an activity by Julius Caesar that is described like this. He wanted to be a real potentate. He was autocratic. He wanted the Roman Senate to submit to him. But a ruler, and I would put it down, the Roman Senate shall bring the reproach against him to an end, and with the reproach removed, he, and shall turn, he shall turn back on him, the Roman Senate turned back on him, and after this he shall turn his face to the coastlands, and, and, and he shall take many. There's one thing about Julius Caesar. He had this saying, I came, I saw, I overcame, I won. And he did. He was very good. He was very good. He was very good at that. Now, note the next verse. This is fascinating. That he shall turn his face towards the fortress of his own land. What is the fortress of his own land here? Rome. It can only be Rome. He went back to Rome. He went back to Rome. But he shall stumble and fall 
In fact, he is not to be found anymore. He was assassinated. What were the names of the assassins? Does anybody know? Brutus, Brutus is one. Who's the other one? <coughs> Cassius. Cassius, very good. Ah, oh, yes. There were actually about 22 of them stepping away, all giving a... Uh, that was a very painful death that he, uh, that he died. But they killed him. They assassinated him because he wanted to be, obviously, the potentate in charge. And uh, the Senate wouldn't have that. Wouldn't have that. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious land. Now, does that ring a bell? Yes. Caesar Augustus was... Caesar... Uh, Julius Caesar was succeeded by... Caesar Augustus, whom we know formally as Octavius. And so what happened is Caesar Augustus becomes in power and he is the one who introduces, and this is really the Roman Empire, and what shall I say, really coming to its own, he raises taxes. And we know from the Bible that that affects the Holy Land as well. In fact, there was a couple there. They, uh, they uh, had a child. And they had to travel from a place called Nazareth to where? Yeah, Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Well, where is Bethlehem? Bethlehem is very close to Jerusalem. That's where it is. Why did he have to go? Why did they both have to go to that place called Bethlehem? It was a census, it was a tax, a taxation, it was like a poll tax, and they needed to be what? Registered, correct? They needed to be registered. And so they had to go to the place of origin, where the family really uh, where they grew up, where the families were, and that little city of Bethlehem was called the city of uh, city of David, because the Messiah would come from the line of David, and they both had to go to Bethlehem. Both had to be therefore of the line of David. Uh, you and I will sit down and I'll work that one out for you. <laughs> no. No, I won't sign up for that. Because that wouldn't cause them to make that journey. They would go to Jerusalem, but not to Bethlehem. There shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, and that was the cause for these three people to go to Bethlehem. That's the nativity story. Talking about Caesar Augustus, here's another very interesting bit. You want to hear this. But within a few weeks, a few days, I'm sorry, he shall be what? Destroyed. But note the qualification. The qualification is fascinating. Not in anger or in battle. By way of exception, Caesar Augustus, Caesar Augustus died peaceably in his bed. He ruled for just over 40 years, but he died peaceably, which is not the case with by far the majority of the Roman emperors. They were poisoned, assassinated, whatever. He died August 1914 AD, a natural death. He raised the taxes. They had been already in the glorious land, and he died peaceably. Now we keep going, we keep going. In his place shall arise a vile person. Now, I already told you, who succeeded Caesar Augustus? No, oh, mate. Further down the track. No, no. Who succeeded Augustus? Tiberius. Tiberius. Good man. It is Tiberius. 
Why did they call Tiberius a vile man? It's a very interesting story. Young Tiberius, uh, who had then a different name, young Tiberius was the son of one of the favorite wives of Caesar Augustus. Her name was Livia. And he was besotted with her, and she made sure that Junior had every possible opportunity to climb the political manor, uh, ladder. And he did. Nobody liked him. He was a bit eccentric. He was a bit of a nerd. Not an easy person to get on with. Nobody really liked him. And he was still, after all, the son of, well, she was a slave woman in principle. Though she had a background as a born from a, from a pagan priest. But it's interesting that nobody liked him, but there was virtually no opposition. Here's another very important thing. Most successions had to be fought about. But this one, they will not give to him the honor of royalty. They never did. I know he became the emperor. But they never looked up to him. They never saw him as an aristocracy. His background was too dubious, despite the favoritism of Caesar Augustus. But he shall come in peaceably. He didn't have to fight to get his position. He came in peaceably, seized the kingdom by intrigue. He was smart, he organized it, and he was the next Caesar. You understand? So far, there is a lot of detail coming your way, I know. Tiberius Caesar, from 14 AD to 37 AD, was the ruler, was the Caesar. Are you with me? Now, what year did we decide and prove to you did Jesus die on the cross? Oh, no, no, don't you mumble at me. I want a good answer this time. 27 AD. 31. Yeah, say sorry. You better bring a cake next time when we're in, in Marubra, all right? Okay. Clearly 31 AD. Now that falls within the reign of Tiberius Caesar. There is an extra biblical historical information here presented to you that says that that prophecy which was given in what year? 536 BC. You don't remember much, do you? It's important. It's important. It is absolutely five and a half centuries before, plus before the event finds place. It was predicted, exactly as predicted. You have a little biography over Julius Caesar, then Caesar Augustus, and then Caesar Tiberius, with lots of details. Nothing to be sneezed at. The details are there. Now have a look at this, have a look at this. With the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken. He was actually very successful with his enemies. He was very successful with his armies. Up north to Europe, pushing further northward and eastward. He did very well. So he, he destroyed his enemies, but note this, note this. And also the prince of the covenant. Now, who is the prince of the covenant? Oh, absolutely. Every commentator will tell you this is messianic. Absolutely messianic. I don't know how the Jews could have missed these details that I just presented to you. They had the writings of Daniel for over 500 years. How come they never got this? To me, to me, the evidence of what we just dealt with is overwhelming. It's really incredible, but there it is. By the way, Pontius Pilate served only under Tiberius Caesar from 26 AD to 36 AD. They died in the same year. 
70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city, that is the Jews and Jerusalem. Now, let's have a look at this as well. Remember that closing date. What was the closing date that we put on the screen for the Jewish probation as a nation? 34. Who said 37? No, it's all right. Don't worry. At least you tried. 34 AD. 34 AD. Let's see if we can find some evidence to that effect. What you see on the left side of the image here goes by the name of the Gallio stone. Now, Gallio was a Roman governor in former Greece. He was a Roman governor. Paul appeared before him. You find it in the book of Acts. You'll find it yourself. The Apostle Paul, according to the Bible, appeared before Gallio, the Roman proconsul. He did. That's what the Bible says. There's something very interesting. This inscription here, with other inscription that's not showing, from that you can conclude, from the Julian calendar, you can conclude very easily reconciled with our Gregorian calendar that Gallio was proconsul from July 51 AD to June 52 AD. You know why? Because that was an appointment that was only for one year. And so we know that Paul appeared before him in the year, say, 51 AD, again with Jewish reckoning. Are you all with me? So he appeared before him 51 AD. Now this is interesting because if you go to the writings of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians, his conversion immediately, three years after he went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, Peter the Apostle. So that's the first three years accounted for after his conversion. Then he says, after 14 years, successive to the three years, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas because he was on a missionary journey. So you understand? And this is fascinating. Now, if you add the three and the 14, is what? Please say 17 because it's there. 17. And that's it. That a girl. If he appeared before before Gallio in 51 AD, you deduct the 17 years, you get 34 AD. What happened in 34 AD? Well, we know. It was the stoning of Stephen. Because straight away after this, he goes to Damascus to persecute the Christians. He gets knocked off his high horse and there's a conversion. Three years later, sees Peter. Another 14 years later after that, he goes back to Jerusalem with Barnabas, his companion. That's 17 years. Straight away after that, he appears before Gallio, 51 AD. Deduct the 17 from the 151. You come back to this event that we're looking at. Yeah? How else do I know that this was the end of the Jewish probation? other than just having fixed the date set in concrete. He, Stephen, being full of the... Have you ever read that, 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 uh, that uh, chapter of Acts? Oh, you should read it. He has a discourse. He speaks to the Jewish people. It is, it is in the form of a covenant lawsuit. And he charges them with their unbelief, their disbelief, their misbehavior, their distrust, and their whatever they did. And then when he speaks on Christ, they don't want to hear him anymore. They get into a rage. And they drag him out of the, of the, uh, the quarters where they held that particular judgment, I suppose. I don't know whether they had a quorum, but they dragged him out through the gates and they would kill him, and they did, outside the gates by way of stoning. And as they were grabbing the stones, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven 
and he saw the glory of God. And now he becomes very specific. He says, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. The emphasis is on the standing. He is standing at the right hand of God. You know, Jesus was not going to take this sitting down. Have a look at the next verse. Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then the stones were flying until he was dead. Standing. That's an act of judgment, really. The judge stands. There's a judgment found. What was the judgment? The close of the probation of the Jewish people. And at this point, from this point onwards, the gospel was carried outside Israel. It went to all nations. Yeah? That's when it went all around the world. From that moment onwards. There was a man standing there looking after the clothes. And he was all in favor of what they did do. And his name was... Yeah, Saul. His name was Saul. Saul of... Tarsus, a Pharisee, trained and schooled under Gamaliel. He had a good reputation. And that's when he took off to Damascus to persecute the Christians. And that's where his conversion found place. It made a very strong impression upon him. Here is, a, here is an irony. Have you ever had it yourself or seen it with others? They're wrong. And then someone comes up with good reasons or good evidence why you are wrong. Well, what should you do? You should concede that you are wrong. Is that correct? But you know, sometimes you just want to be right so badly. You become so angry. You become so obstinate. You still want to prove that you're right. Anybody? Yes, some of you are laughing, others are staring in space. We all like that sometimes, we human. Well, that impressed him so much, but he fought it. He fought the conviction that got hold of him. This act marked the final rejection of Jesus by the Jewish nation. It remains a remarkable fact that three and a half years after Calvary, they still had a chance to turn around for three and a half years. Such is the grace of God. Now, Friedrich Nietzsche, he is one of the great proponents of existentialism. I don't know whether you know what it is. It is a philosophy that says you, the individual, determine what is right, what is wrong, and the meaning of life, if it's there at all. It's a very weird, <laughs> but it's very popular. It was very popular in the 19th century, very, and it still is not gone. The pronouncement of Friedrich Nietzsche in 1882, God is dead. You know, he took, he took an ad in the paper. He took out an ad in the paper. And being an atheist, and he said, and he sat there and he paid for the ad. He said, God is dead. Signed, Nietzsche. A few weeks later, Nietzsche died. Someone took out an ad in the paper. Nietzsche is dead. Signed, God. <laughs> It's a true story. It's a true story. You know, you know, for me to explain to you what this philosophy is, uh, let me do another true occurrence. In this true occurrence, uh, there was a philosophy teacher, and he, he just had lectured on, along these lines of existentialism. And then, and then what he did, he took a chair, he took a chair, and he put it on the desk. And he said to his students... This is your final exam. I want you to write down why this chair does not exist. You got 45 minutes. 
everybody was writing, talking, thinking, everybody was right. There was one guy, 30 seconds. Done. He was the only one who got an A. He had the highest mark. He only wrote down two words. What chair? <laughs> you like that? And that's how people deal with God. See, he did. He did. He says the dawn of science would be the doom of faith. Well, science have dawned and faith still continues. And then he comes up with a classic like that. There are no facts. There are only interpretations. How do you make that out? This is not the logic way, so he might as well go. Professor Peter Stoner selected eight prophetic statements about Jesus. Eight. Um, the chance that eight prophecies all came true in any one man, he said, is one in... Can you explain to me what it says? <laughs> Underneath it, you got the man's qualifications. He was not an idiot. He worked it out. He proved it. That's just eight. There are dozens and dozens and dozens prophetic statements in the Old Testament about the Lord Jesus Christ. They're all there. They're all there. Now, <coughs> experiential evidence, we're almost there. Subjective evidence, well, you can only get that when you experience God, isn't it? And I can't tell you, there's no point in me saying that I experienced that because you have to take my word for it. And does it therefore become evidence? Not to you if you haven't got that experience. It can only become your experience if it happens to you. There's no other way. This you can only acquire by yourself. No one can give it to you. John 3.16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him should have eternal life and not perish. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's a wonderful summary of God. That is a wonderful summary of Jesus. Philip Yancey said this. He said, you know, there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. Well, read it again. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more. Why? Here. There is nothing you can do to make God love us less. He may hate what you do, but he loves you. You understand? There's no point walking out of here and saying, it didn't apply to me. It does apply to you. It absolutely does apply to you. This is important. You should know this. So, if I'm unwilling to make any adjustments in my life that might be necessary to follow God, then I will not experience God. Get it? You have to go to a designer God that does not exist. The same Philip Janssen was a chaplain on a high on the, no, university. And he gave lectures in religion. And there were certain students, and one particular one, who definitely did not want to come to his lectures. He said, I don't want to come. He said, oh, that's all right. I won't make you. He said, good, because I don't believe in God. He said, that's great, that's great. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Tell me about the God you don't believe in. Because I probably don't believe in him either. Are you getting the message? The rejection of God is based on one of two things. Either your unwillingness to change, and you'll do anything, to argue God out of your life. Or you have completely got the wrong picture of God. And John 3.16 is gooblygook to you.
You with me? It's true. Paul on the road to Damascus, we mentioned it. Man, that must have been something. He only saw the light when he lost his sight. No question about it. You know why he made it? Lord, what do you want me to do? If you want the ultimate evidence of the existence of God, if you want the ultimate evidence of who Jesus truly is, you got to come to that point in your life. What is it you want me to do? And if you do that, he will tell you, he will tell you, he will be walking with you, he will never leave you. He will never leave you. He will never take his eyes off you. And that's, that's the certainty that we have. So, maybe Jeremiah has the last word. And you will seek me, he said. How? You will find me. How? When you search for me, now finish it for me. With all your... That's it. That's the message for this afternoon. You'll find him. There's not a person here who would turn to God who would not find him. You'll find him. And the reason you will find him is because he has found you already because you're sitting here. May God bless you. May God bless you. Do we have a special item? Yes. Good. Every 
time I come back to Him, He is waiting with open arms, and I see once again. Faithful, faithful to me, looking back, His love and mercy I see, though in my heart I have questioned, even failed to believe, yet He been faithful, faithful in my heart. I have questioned, even failed to believe, yet he's been faithful, faithful. Yes, he's been faithful to me. To me. Thank you, Charles. That, that was absolutely beautiful um god is faithful he really is and it's never too late to go back to him shall we bow our heads heavenly father we thank you that you are the god that you are thank you for what you let us know and how we can see the facts and how we can trust your word and lord you you have been very good to us and we've been unfaithful too often. I'm really sorry about that. And so, Lord, as we come to you, and as we have this sorrow that we did what we did, we want you to know that we want to turn away from all that is evil, for all that is against your will and your way. We are willing to walk that narrow path. And whatever price there is to pay, it couldn't ever stand in the shadow of what was paid at Calvary so long ago. And so as we turn to you here this moment, this very moment, as we turn to you and seek you, please send your spirit in a portion, wholly undeserving, but in a portion that keeps us strong, that keeps us staying with you, that makes us faithful to the wonderful Savior that we are blessed with. Thank you for being our God. Lord, as we have the fellowship, we partake of the food, stay with our number. As we go into the week ahead, Draw us close to you each moment, every day. In Jesus' most precious name, amen. God bless you.